All right, we're going to get started here. So welcome to a talk about fake net. Uh, so I guess we could start by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Mike Sikorsky. Uh, I've uh, worked for a company called Mandiant for about seven years and recently got bought, acquired by a company called FireEye. There I founded a team called uh, the Flare, which is the FireEye Labs Advanced Reverse Engineering team. We just recently put on a challenge. Did anybody do the, cha the flare, ch flare on challenge? A couple people? No? Nobody did the Flare on challenge? Uh, it was like a sort of like a binary puzzles. Um, you can still access them on flare-on.com. And uh, it's just a series of puzzles you can download and play around with. Um, and uh, also uh, wrote a book called Practical Matter Analysis with my co-author here, Andy Honing. And part of that, writing the book, we we realized there was kind of a gap uh, for tools, and uh, that's kind of why we created the tool uh, of FakeNet. Um, Andy, want to introduce yourself? The, the book's in English as well. I'm not sure why you put a foreign language version on there. Um, but I'm Andy Honig. Uh, I work for Google. I work on virtualization security. Um, but before that, I was with NSA for eight years, uh, doing malware and reverse engineering stuff. And I'm based in New York City, and he's based in Seattle. And this is, I think, I think the first time we've presented together. So, so outline for the talk, what's, what are we going to actually cover today? Um, we're actually spaced uh, with an hour before lunch and then an hour after lunch. Uh, we're going to separate it into two halves. The first half is going to be like lecturing and demoing, and then the second half is going to be actually the hands-on where you can actually use FakeNet and do a lab, and then we'll go over the lab at the end of that hour. So two halves, first half is not hands-on, second half is hands-on. So after lunch, if you want to get hands-on, that's when you're going to uh, use what we're passing out. We have six USB keys going around the room, being copied. We're not going to actually use the stuff on those keys until we come back from lunch, which is like 2 o'clock. So we have a lot of time to copy those keys. Um, the key has a, a VM on it. It's VMware, so you're going to need to install VMware if you don't have it. You can download a free trial of VMware Workstation from their website. And it's a 30-day trial, but it'll easily get you through the class today. Um, so anyway, what we're, we're going to cover is, did I cover everything we wanted to Please say? Yeah, and if you, have a, if you finish copying the USB key, put it up in the air. Somebody else who wants to copy it will come grab it from you. And that'll be the protocol rather than keep running them up here and we keep getting interrupted with it. So. Just keep those circulating, keep copying, and then uh, everybody will have it. So that way, when we come back after lunch, you'll be able to get hands-on, which will be fun. The VM is not available online now. Just passing out here. We, are, we, are, uh, we will have FakeNet available for download, but it, it's, uh, this is for educational purposes. So you should, you should remove the VM after, after the end of the workshop. Good question. So anyway, what are we going to cover in the talk today? We're going to talk about malware in the network, introducing the tool FakeNet, talk about how we, why faking the network is very important for malware analysis. Then we're going to talk about FakeNet, all of its features, how to set it up, how to use it, um, and uh, how it's implemented so you can understand how it works uh, under the hood. And then we'll talk about the new features that we're releasing um, and how you can use them. And that's the lab that we're going to cover after lunch, which will be hands-on, portion of the class will show you, you know, take you through all the different features of FakeNet and, and demonstrate to you why it's useful in a couple occasions for malware analysis. So, background. Uh, malware on the network. Malware on the network likes to hide in plain sight. They want to avoid being detected by, by you, right? Um, so their goal is they're going to try and blend in as much as they can, and they're going to use a variety of tactics to do so. They're going to do that by either using protocols that you already use. Um, and on occasion, yeah, we still see some custom binary protocols, but it's more rare. A lot more often they're going to use protocols that you already uh, have on your network. So an example of this is, you know, attackers like popular protocols, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, you know, anything that you have all over your network they're just going to try and slip in with that because there's just too much traffic for you to keep up with, and therefore they're going to try and uh, you know blend in with that. 
you know, IRC used to be a popular malware protocol, and then people started eliminating it on their network. When they started eliminating it on their network, you know what? Malware stopped using IRC, right? So when we push the attackers to go, you know, into a protocol that, that we allow on our network, that's where they're going to go. And so very commonly, malware will use, you know, get and post requests, things like that. And, uh, and so, yeah. Also, attackers like to use existing infrastructure. So, you know, rather than have dedicated server for, for their, you know, serving up their botnet or their malware or whatever, it's very easy to stick out, right? They could see it, find a domain name, you could blacklist it. Um, uh, that infrastructure could, could be caught sort of easily. So what they like to do is, you know, use infrastructure that's already out there, compromise somebody else's web server, and, you know, uh, serve the malware up that way. Um, also, client-initiated beaconing. This is very popular with malware, right? Because they somehow get run on your on inside your network, and um, they make all their connections outbound from within your network. Uh, and because and because they're doing that, the attacker actually makes it very difficult for them to know where they are in your network. You know, maybe some maybe they exploited somebody with a Word doc. Maybe one of those zero days that that came out this past Tuesday. You know, Word doc came into them and. You know, they were compromised, but the attacker doesn't really know who they compromised or where on the network. And so one of the first things the malware will do is beacon from inside the network and say, hey, this is where I am on the network. This is the machine I'm on, uh, and, and that type of information. Very often, understanding how that initial beacon, initial profile is passed out by the malware uh, is uh, useful to get network signatures and things like that for a given uh, piece of malware. So... So why do we care to fake the network when we're doing malware analysis? Well, we want to trick the malware to thinking it's, everything's fine, right? We don't want it to think that it's on a system that we're analyzing. If it thinks that, it might behave differently, might delete itself, might just act differently so we, we don't realize what its true functionality is. Also, also, very commonly, malware will check for, hey, do I have an IP address? If I don't have an IP address, why am I going to go out over the network? I should immediately delete myself or, or something along those lines. Also, malware will often go to, let's say, you know, Google.com first and say, am I getting a page back from Google? If I am, then I know I'm connected to the Internet, and now I'm going to do my bad functionality. So therefore, if we're not tricking the malware to thinking it's connected to the Internet and has an IP address, then you know, the malware might just terminate itself. So we want to keep the malware running as, as much as possible. So we want to keep it going, running, as, and that gives us as much indicators as possible. So our goal when we're doing malware analysis is to tease out all the indicators we can. This means uh, host-based indicators or net, uh, network-based indicators, just signatures we can use to uh, identify the malware, right? And the more that the malware runs, the more likelihood we're going to get these signatures out of it. And so therefore, by faking the network, we're able to keep the code running as long as possible. Right, so if the malware is re requesting web pages, we want to give it web pages so that it keeps doing other things. Right, part of a huge downfall of sandboxes in general, or uh, malware, uh, some forms of malware analysis, um, like dynamic analysis, uh, is you don't get the full code, code coverage because you know only a portion of what what will execute uh, within the malware actually runs. But by by faking that work, maybe we could get additional code coverage. So a lot of good reasons why we want to be faking the network. So what existing tools are there out there other than fake net, right? So when we were writing chapter three of the book, which is the basic dynamic analysis, sort of before you get to, you know, inside of Vita Pro or, or looking at assembly code, you know, when you're just using tools. We, we didn't find any of the tools for networking were easy to use. Um, and it just seemed to be a gap in the field as far as, you know, why is there no simple tool to use on Windows um, for this? So what we did was we went through and, and surveyed all the tools, tools. So, you know, back in the day when I started doing malware analysis, there was, like, tools like fake DNS. It was just a very uh, simple tool that came with the Malcode Analyst Pack. Uh, you installed in your local machine, and uh, I think there's a key. You install it on your uh, local machine, and it, it just responds to DNS requests. It's got a little GUI, um, and it you know just listens on port 53 and re returns whatever server you say. Most most of the time, this is in the form of 
uh, the local host. So this is what fake DNS looks like. It's not a very uh, impressive GUI, and it was pretty buggy. It crashed a lot, and it was kind of frustrating to use. If, if any of you have used it, you probably know that. Um, and that, it, it, all it really did was DNS, right, and locally. And you had to, like, reconfigure all your settings. So if you wanted to, you know, you'd have to set your DNS server locally so that fake DNS would work because that's where you're listening on port 53 if you're running the tool. You get the point. There were other DNS tools that came out, uh, like Apate and, and also fake Fake DNS, which is part of the uh, the Remnix uh, distribution, but and then everybody just had their own Python script for for doing DNS, and so but like I said, it's, this is only really supporting DNS, and um, there wasn't a lot of features to those tools. Of course, there's Netcat. You all know what Netcat is, sort of the Swiss Army knife of of uh, networking, and so you could play along with around with that, right? We could listen in this example we see there is, you know, we're listening on port 80, but it's raw, it's difficult to use, you're going to have to, um, you know, depending on what uh, traffic is coming in, you're going to have to script it up to be able to respond in a proper way to the malware, and so, you know, not a lot of infrastructure built around that. Then sort of the best tool that was out there was iNetSim. iNetSim is uh, still available, it's a Linux-based VM, you can download it for free. Uh, and it emulates all the common services, so HTTP, you know, SSL, FTP, all these different uh, services are already there. And it serves up what it can. It's fully configurable. You could go in and manipulate it as much as you want. Uh, but, you know, there's assembly required, right? It's like you, you have to have, first of all, you have to have a separate VM. So if you, ha if you do a lot of your malware analysis inside of Windows, which if you're dealing with Windows malware, you're going to be do doing the analysis inside of Windows, Therefore, your Windows VM is going to have to be connected to your uh, iNetSim Linux VM, and you're going to have to create networking, right? You have to create a route between them. And uh, also, if DNS is going to be going out to this iNetSim server, I, iNetSim server, you're going to have to set DNS inside your Windows box to go to that this machine. Um, also, if uh, if malware goes directly to an IP address rather than do DNS first. You're going to run into a problem if you don't have routing set up properly, right? Because it's not going to know that, oh, this IP address should go straight to iNetSim. So it just requires a lot of work to kind of get things going uh, with iNetSim. Uh, but once you do have it up and running, uh, it's pretty flexible in what it can, can do for you. But this is what I'm talking about. It's like you have to have a kind of a complicated setup to get it working. You need the two virtual machines. You need to have DNS redirecting and then uh, to access the services inside of uh, iNetSim. So it's just kind of like a whole bunch of things you have to work around um, to get it to work. And uh, that was really all there was. There wasn't a lot of you know, tools out there for faking the network for malware analysis. And that's when we came up with FakeNet. So I'll pass it off to Andy here. So, is this on? All right, thanks. Um, so we came up with FakeNet, and what were our goals? Um, the number one priority that we had when designing this um, was that it's simple to run. Um, so there were a lot of tools out there that did a lot of things. He talked about them, but they were kind of a pain in the ass. Um, and I know for me at the time, I wasn't doing malware analysis all the time. I was doing it here or there and kind of dabbling. So to have a two-hour setup time to do malware analysis or have a machine dedicated to do it and you know, make, spend two days setting that up was kind of a lot of effort just to do malware analysis once a week or once a month. So I wanted something that you can just download, run, do your analysis, move on. Um, I want to make it easy to configure. Even, it, even though configuration isn't required for most things, it can get fairly powerful. Um, I want to cover the most popular protocols. So if you look at iNet SIM, iNet SIM covers more protocols. And there's certainly, if you set up two VMs, you could certainly add more protocols and have a better setup with a bit fuller sandbox. But I'm going to cover the most ones, and that covers 95% of malware. Uh, and a lot of what's left is using a custom protocol, so nothing is really going to solve that problem. I wanted it to run right on the Windows VM. There's a downside to that, right, that the malware is running. You're running in the same place the malware is, which isn't always great, because the malware could detect you, or the malware could have the system compromised so thoroughly that uh, fake net doesn't see it. Um, but I thought the trade-offs were, were still pretty good there, that you don't have another VM, and you can just run it right there. Uh, I do want to make sure you can, can trick all the networking operations. So if you look at fake DNS or using a fake DNS, um, there are ways that malware doesn't hit against that. So if malware doesn't do a DNS lookup, then fake DNS doesn't see it, obviously. 
Uh, and that's sometimes true with INET SYN. If it goes to a hard-coded address, unless you've really set up your routing very well, you're not actually going to see it uh, and respond to, that question, uh, respond to that request on INET SYN. Uh, I use the layered service provider, which uh, I'm, you're, most of you are probably not familiar with because it wasn't very popular at Microsoft, um, but it's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, I wanted to support PCAP captures. Um, so one of the things about Windows is you can't do a PCAP capture on local on a local adapter. Um, so if you've ever tried it, uh, Wireshark won't do it for you. Um, so I wanted to have something that lets you do that. Um, I wanted to make it extensible and have an easy way to sort of make a somewhat complicated web server. Obviously, I'm not going to rewrite Apache, but something that looks like a realistic web server. So now I'm going to talk about usage. Um, so basically, uh, here's an example. Um, and we're, here's where we post sort of like the bleeding edge, you know, unstable version, which is kind of what FlakeNet 2.0 is, is at, I think. When we scheduled this, we were hoping to have a stable release by now, but, you know, life and busy and bugs. Um, so here's what it looks like. Um, basically, we'll, po we'll post that link again later. Yeah, and we'll post that link again later. So it puts things in brackets um, that are sort of messages from FakeNet. So the malware runs. Uh, it does a DNS query. You see that it has uh, the domain name. Uh, it then call, it calls get um, on, a, on an HTTP request. It shows you the request. It shows you the user agent. It shows you the other headers and options. Um, so, you know, already you kind of get some decent uh, indicators for the malware, right? You know what domains it's using, you know what user agent it's using, which is often a good, uh, a good signature. And all you really had to do was run, mal run fake net and then run the malware. Um, what happens when it actually downloads a file? So sometimes malware will go out and download a file and then do something with that file. So it'll download a PDF or it'll download something. So we want to make sure we actually send it a file that looks reasonable. So let's say it downloads a PDF and then uses, you know, parses that and starts doing that so you can see what it does with it. Um, so here's an example. If it asks for a PDF, uh, it gets it. Um, so in this case, you see, the, you see the domain request, you see the get request, uh, and it actually responds. Uh, and then on the bottom, you actually see um, Adobe, somehow Adobe is, is notified that, uh, that a PDF has been opened and then Adobe does some sort of callback. So you see that as well. So you don't just see the malware, right? You're faking the network for everything on the system. Um, so you will see regular network traffic. What about a program that's a downloader? Um, so again, like I said, whenever a file is downloaded, we try to make it match what the program is expected. So here's an example where a malware went out and did a GET request. And if you look, uh, the GET request is for an EXE. So when it calls a uh, GET request for an EXE, we pass it back a working executable because we want it to see what it does. Uh, and what's the working executable? It's sort of the mini program that just does a pop-up. So if the malware was something that went out to a website, downloaded an EXE, and ran it, you've now figured that out, and that's obvious. And that's a pretty common malware functionality, and it's not super difficult to figure that out otherwise, in other ways. But if you don't want to connect to the network, this is actually a pretty easy way to do it. And it gives it back no matter what EXE it asks for, whatever path, whatever, wherever it goes, it's going to pass back to this EXE. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation. Um, so layered service providers are this interesting thing in Windows. Um, that basically allows you to hook all WinSock functionality. So it was kind of done, I'm not sure the reason Microsoft did it, probably for filters and proxies and other things like that, um, but every time anything that uses WinSock makes a call, it'll actually look through the installed LSP WinSock service providers and it will call them, and, and it will let them make any arbitrary changes to that network request. Um, so it became fairly common, not super common, but fairly common for malware to use this. Um, not a lot of legitimate products used it, but malware can use it to sort of inject packets or manipulate packets or <coughs> scan packets. Security products use it. They use it for filtering. They use it for quality of service. There's no reason we can't use it too. And then we set up, so additional list, uh, layer server providers, we have uh, network listeners that sort of are just looking for traffic um, and responding uh, to the appropriate protocol. Oh, so how does it work? There's a DLL. It automatically gets loaded into every single WinSock process. FakeNet installs that WinSock, uh, that WinSock LSP provider. There's some registry uh, artifacts to that. Uh, there's a USB stick in the front if anyone's still looking for one. Um, and then here's actually all of the functions that you get to hook. Uh, it's quite a long list. It's pretty much everything useful that you'd ever want to hook in a network. So. Once we've hooked the network traffic and we redirect it and we've done something interesting with it, we actually need to respond to it. So what listeners have we implemented? Um, so listeners, we do TCP and UDP, we do HTTP, we do ICMP, we do, there's a dummy listener. Um, so what that dummy listener does is it listens and responds on every single port um, and just sort of brings it up, puts the output. 
Um, one, of the things about, one of the interesting things about the dummy listener is you can't actually listen to every port on Windows. If you just try to call, uh, you know, bind, listen on, on every port, you're not going to succeed. Um, eventually, Windows will say, you, you can't do that. It'll run out of memory, it'll run out of resources, and, and it'll crash. Um, so how this works is because FakeNet's able to hook every single call, when it sees a call to an outbound port, while it, 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 you know, it blocks on that call, it waits a little while, and then while, the, while that call is blocked, it opens a socket in another thread. So as soon as you start to try to go to address, then I'm going to open up a port and listen to it. There's DNS, there's HTTPS, um, there's also Python extensions. Set it up. So there really isn't any setup. You just click it and run. But there is things that you can uh, do to change it. So I'll talk about some of the files and how they're laid out and what their purpose is. So there's a default files directory. And that does pretty much what it looks like it does. Um, those are the files that will get sent. So there's a PDF and an executable and an HTML file. When you get a request for any of those extensions, that will get sent. Um, so to get to the help file for FakeNet, you run FakeNet, you open your browser, and you go to any URL. And it downloads it, and it's going to load the default HTML. So that's the default HTML file is, is the help file. There's the extensions directory where you can put all your extensions. Uh, it comes with one example extension to make that clear, to show you how to work, how to do it. Uh, there's a config file. Um, like I said, it's, you don't need to configure it, but there are a lot and a lot of options just because Depending on malware, there's a lot of things you might want to do to actually analyze the malware. Um, there's certificates. Uh, those are the, the .pm files. Um, so when you get an HTTPS request, uh, you need to provide some sort of a certificate. So those are the certificates that it provides. Um, the reason why that's kind of a useful thing is sometimes malware will actually check the signature that's being provided by the client. So if you, you the part being provided by the server, excuse me. So if malware has gone all the way to actually write the checking code into their malware, you really don't, you don't have the malware certificate, right? You don't have the attacker's command and control certificate, so you can't do anything. But malware writers are usually pretty lazy, and they use the OS's signature verification thing. So what you can do is you can add a new cert here that you signed uh, with your own CA, with your own signing certificate, that you add to your trust, your root trust on Windows, so you can actually provide you know, good signed signatures to malware that, that's looking for that. Uh, and then there's the WSP DLL, which is what's uh, being injected. Running, you, you, you just double click on it. Uh, a couple things that you need to do that uh, that are worth that are worth mentioning is you need to have network connectivity of some sort. So if your VM has to has to have a network adapter that's connected, if Windows detects that the physical network isn't connected, you actually can't use WinSock at all. Uh, and then every time you install a new version, you have to reboot. Um, that's kind of annoying. Uh, if I were a better programmer, you wouldn't have to deal with that, but I'm not. <laughs> oh, and explain that. Oh, yeah, so usually in the VM, the way we run it is host-only mode, so that way it only talks to the host. And you don't actually have to allow any traffic or give it an IP address or anything like that, but it just has to be connected in a connected state. Um, I wish I could get around that, too, but I, I've talked to a lot of other people who run that same problem, and I'm, I'm not sure there's a way around it. Just use your sandbox escape and enable it. <laughs> um, so configuration. Um, so FakeNet actually will reconstruct a packet, capture, a packet capture that you can open in Wireshark or some other tools. Um, I want to point out that it's not an actual standard packet capture. So it's not a capture of the network of packets going across the wire. Um, as I said earlier, Windows won't let you, WinPCAP does not support local adapter um, for reasons that are complicated and deal with Windows internals and not that interesting. Um, but I still want to have a packet capture. So being that FakeNet is one of the two sides of every single, uh, of every single connection being made, it knows, it sees every packet. So there's like sort of a reconstructed packet capture. Uh, it's definitely different. You're, you're going to notice differences like there's no Ethernet frame because it never actually made it on an Ethernet wire. Um, I, also, you know, I also do something that it confuses people, but I still think it's the right usability trade-off. Uh, if there's SSL traffic in the packet capture, I just showed the decrypted SSL. So you're looking at a packet capture, and you're thinking, oh, this is, these are the actual exact bytes. But, so it's not the actual exact bytes because I stripped off the SSL layer. Um, but for me, that's just much easier because you want to see the actual data. You know, maybe you care about the SSL headers, uh, in which case you can turn that feature off. Um, but normally, it, it's on, and, and that way you get the un, you get the unencrypted traffic. Uh, and then there's like sort of the options for how you specify whether you want it on and what you'd like the file name to be, and then it automatically creates a new file name with the date and time for each capture. Um, you know, as as you show as I showed you before, the the output is ASCII text, so. Obviously, you need to do this if you want to do something useful with the binary data. The so-called invasive options, these are the ones that use LSP. 
Um, the reason I split them out is because uh, they're, the, a, they're, they only support on Windows XP right now, so getting them because LSP was deprecated. So all the other features work on OLOSs, and if this goes wrong, if there's a bug in this or a problem with this, it's, it's worse for your system. So I certainly like to turn it off when I'm developing. Uh, another option is sort of direct to IP or redirect all traffic. That means even if something doesn't do a DNS request, it'll redirect it to fake net. So if something goes out, let's say, let's say there's malware out there that uh, checks to make sure that the DNS response isn't to 127.0.0.1. So if you look at fake DNS, how that worked is you would set your DNS listener to always respond with localhost as the DNS server. Or you'd set the DNS server to localhost. But malware would detect that, or it would detect that the DNS response is localhost and say, well, I'm not running in a real environment. And that, that's not an unreasonable reasonable thing. You would never do a DNS query and get localhost back in my real malware, so it wouldn't run. Um, so what, what this feature does, it allows you to actually make your DNS response equal to something else. So when the malware does a DNS request, you can actually respond with 9.2.3.4, then the malware will actually call out to 9.2.3.4, but you direct it anyway with FakeNet. So re FakeNet will redirect it after the malware does that. Um, there's only that's sort of max listeners. As I said earlier, if you try to listen to every single port on Windows, uh, you're not gonna, you're not, it's not going to work. You're going to have a bad time. Uh, so if something does a port scan and I open up every single port to see what traffic that is, it'll eventually crash. So I said to sort of, by default, there's 100 max, but you can change that. DNS options, it, it automatically modifies your local DNS settings unless you tell it not to. Uh, and then there's a new option that Mike will talk about later. Output options, do you want to dump the HTTP post blobs? So if a malware does an HTTP post, do you want to bump, dump that blob? If you do, where should you put it? What do you want to call the file? Uh, and then he'll talk about process lossing and post response. Listener, these are all the types of uh, protocols you can listen to. Uh, then you can have respond with the appropriately formed patter, uh, packets. There's the DNS listeners. There's HTTP. There's raw, which essentially just sends out, just displays the bytes and does acts, but doesn't actually send any traffic back. There's an ICMP listener. And there's a Python extension one. Um, and it comes with an SMP listener, just for, as an example, because SMP is a, a pretty simple protocol. So the Python, the Python extension for that's only about 50 lines, and it covers most of the protocol, and also works with HTTPS. Um, how do the Python listeners work? Basically, you have to write two functions. You have to write an init function that can do nothing, but it gets called when you, when you run. And then you have to write a new connection function. So whenever there's a new connection, it calls your Python script. You, you call send and receive data um, whenever you want to send and receive data to the other side. So it's, it's super useful when you're dealing with malware that has sort of custom encodings or custom protocols. OK, um, so Fame, uh, one of the things that we thought was pretty cool, you kind of know your tool has made it when botnets and malware starts looking for you. Um, so this is a, 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 from, from a blue coat security advisory uh, with the push do botnet. Uh, he, he ran it with FakeNet to do analysis, and he noticed that the, after doing a bunch of completely random looking uh, query responses, query requests, uh, it would actually try to make an SMTP connection to practicalmalwarenalysis.com, which is sort of our web, the website for the book. Which seems a little strange. Um, in fact, if he hadn't do that, we probably wouldn't have noticed this. Um, but that's because it was looking for fake net. And if you run it without fake net, then you see that it actually uses different, different addresses. And, and I don't actually know how it detected fake net. Uh, we probably could figure that out and make it less than. But we feel like the, the tool kind of arrived when we see it start seeing botnets looking for it. Um, and that's probably a sign that we need to. Fake net.exe. Right? Yeah, and it was just looking for fake net.exe. So it's not like it would be hard for us to get around. All right, so I'm going to pass it back to Mike to talk about new features. Yeah, you know your tool is finally in use when malware authors actually care about it. Um, so, uh, this is, we've all, we've all got ramped up so far into how FakeNet works uh, and also sort of all the features that we've had out there. Um, but now we're going to release some new features and we'll talk about those. So uh, the first one uh, is process logging. So this is a pretty huge feature because now you can find out the exact name of the process as well as the PID uh, for the connection that's actually happening. So, for example, if malware 
you know, if you run an ex a malware that's just an executable and it goes out to the network, you're like, oh yeah, okay, I assume that that's what's doing the connection. But that might not actually be true. It might actually be injecting into a process that's injecting into a process that eventually beacons out to the network. And you often want to know as a malware analyst, well, which process is responsible for talking out over the network, right? You can think about how something like Poison Ivy works is that it injects in, in, into a process that in, uh, in, ends up injecting into Internet Explorer, and that's what actually goes out. And with using this process logging, you'll be able to see that very quickly. You'll be able to target that process and say, all right, there's something more going on with my malware. It's doing some type of process injection. I need to figure out uh, how to track that down and make sure I don't miss that in my na next analysis step. But it'll tell you where it's connecting to. In this example you see, it you know, says port 80. Um, so we could pinpoint the process, and it's just an, it's just an uh, option inside the config file uh, that we showed you earlier, right? It's just uh, process logging, yes or no, and then it shows that. It specifically logs four different things. Uh, so UDP for the send to. So if it, you know, malware does DNS, you'll, you'll catch that with the send to. And then if they do something over port 80 like HTTP, you'll catch that with a connect. Also, any sockets that a cre uh, malware creates, that'll also be caught and logged with the process name, uh, as well as when they close down the socket. So let me uh, do a quick demo here. So I'll start by launching FakeNet, and then we'll just make sure it runs by... We go to a website, went to Microsoft.com, looks like, and it served up the fake net help file. And we see that here, there was a get request, uh, DNS for query for Microsoft.com. So we can close fake net. We can go into our settings for fake net. On the VM, uh, inside of C Tools, fake net 2 is where we're going to be looking today. We could open up the configuration file. And uh, inside the configuration file, we just want to uh, test some of these new features. Uh, first is process logging. So process logging will, will happen now when I run FakeNet, hopefully. And when I go to Internet Explorer, and I can go to a web page like google.com, uh, and then I'll see that it, it requested uh, Google.com here. And then it also says Internet Explorer connected uh, via over localhost, <laughs> because that's where I'm listening, uh, to port 80. Um, and, you know, the PID of Internet Explorer was 1664. And, of course, that makes sense because I went into Internet Explorer and I browsed to that website. So it makes sense that that would get logged. So that's just the process logging in action. Uh, the next option, uh, new feature that we added, uh, is this one's pretty exciting, is debug breakpoint. And so this enables you to cause an exception on purpose when uh, there's a connection that occurs. Uh, so this enables us to trace exactly the source of the malicious connection. So we can break right when the connection happens. And uh, of course we're going to need to, since we're causing an exception inside the process, we're basically going to crash it if we don't handle that exception. Therefore, we need to set a just-in-time debugger. So, for example, Ali debug, just set it as your just-in-time debugger. That way, when you have this feature turned on, the process doesn't crash. Instead, it'll break inside your debugger, uh, and the debugger will actually handle the exception and pause execution at, at a nice place for you. We can do things like uh, trace the call stack in the debugger. Uh, that's one example, of, and see where the code was coming from to make the call to connect. Um, and that's, uh, this is a quick way for us to get straight to that code. So not only are we going to be able to log the process and know which process we're running in, but here we could actually break inside that process. So let's say that, you know, malware, uh, you know, you just want to figure out what code is, you know, where in the malware is the code connecting out. Maybe there's some obfuscation in there that gets deobfuscated, and you just want to see exactly where that code is, what's happening around that code. This is a good feature to use for that. Another option is, let's say malware injects shell code into a process, and that shell code is, is unravels itself um, through a bunch of obfuscation. Eventually, uh, it resolves all the function names and, and all the imports that it actually wants to call out to. Finally, the malware, uh, the shell code does a connect. You'll break inside that shell code. 
you could then go to that shell code, dump it all out, and analyze it. So a very quick way for you to go from, from ma running malware to extracting the shell code. You know, norm normally the, the way you'd have to do it is either you know, set a breakpoint where the shell code injection's happening, maybe dump it out that way. Even then, you still have to then manually take the shell code and unravel it to get to the, you know, where the network comms are happening. Here, the, mal uh, the shell code will be completely unraveled, and you'll be able to dump it out that way. So a much, much faster way to be able to, to get your answers. And it specifically pauses on when a connect happens. So not the creation of a socket, nothing like that. Just when a connect happens, that's when we're going to uh, pause. This is uh, under the, in the configuration. This is under invasive option. And uh, it's for a connection break. You just set it to yes or no. So let's demo the debug breakpoint feature. And I'm going to close my browser here. And I'm going to close uh, FakeNet since I am reconfiguring it. So inside the configuration, I'm just going to change the connection break to yes. Then I will rerun FakeNet. And one thing with FakeNet is you got to realize is that any networking that happens on your machine, FakeNet's going to catch it. So that's why we're seeing like, you know, Windows machines are pretty chatty, right? There's NetBIOS, all this, all this crap that they're always doing. And so, yeah, SVC host made a network connection. Big surprise. It happens all the time. But FakeNet's going to catch it because we're going to catch everything that's happening. So one thing you've got to be careful of is to not confuse yourself as to what's the malware activity versus not. So this might require you to maybe rerun FakeNet a few different times just to make sure that, you know, we haven't run malware yet, so we know that, hey, that SVC host is not related to malware. Um, but it's just something you've got to be aware of. Sort of like if you ever use a tool like Procmon, right, and you're, you're monitoring malware, you know, it, it logs 100,000 events. You have to sift through those events. Same kind of thing happens on the network. It's just a lot less events than on the, all the syscalls in the, in the Procmon case. So running a fake net, uh, and then I'm going to go on to the Z drive, which is where our malware is, Z malware. And the first one I'm going to run is web server. But we have to do one thing before we do that. We have to set our just-in-time debugger, right? Because if I just run malware, it connects out. We're going to crash because we're not handling that exception. So we have to go inside of uh, our tools. Uh, in this example, I'm just going to use Ollie. So we'll set just-in-time debugging. So we made Ollie our just-in-time debugger. We hit done, close it out. Now if, uh, when we cause an exception, our debugger is going to pop up for us. So we run the web server. And uh, it pauses. You know, right when the connect was about to happen inside that process. We're inside the exception here, so we just got to step a few times to get back to where, that, uh, where the code broke. And then we can do, uh, take a look at our call stack. And if we observe the call stack, before connect called, it called, you know, it, inside of Windows, it called, you know, I don't know, what, 20, 30 functions inside of Win, the WinINet library before the connect was finally made. Um, depending on how high of a level function call you make, the malware makes, um, it could take a while before the connect happens down the road. But at the end of the day, the connect's going to happen in order for that connection to go out. And when we look at this call stack here, we see something very interesting. We see internet open URL. That's uh, maybe what the malware called to be able to, uh, to get there. And then we can, since we have the call stack here, we can just double click to go to that, that place inside the call stack. And, um, and so this is where the code uh, did the call uh, for connect. And we see things like, you know, we see internet open URL, internet open, internet read file. These are all a set of APIs that are very commonly used to, you know, download a web page. Also, internet open is used for setting the user agent. And in this malware's case, their user agent was internet surf bear. 
So, you know, a lot of code uh, we can analyze around right where the connection happened because we were able to break at that spot right when the malware did the connection. We didn't do any disassembly or anything like that. We're right at the code location we want to analyze. So that's the web server example. And web server looks like it went out to custombikephotos.com. Next example I want to do is demo.exe here. So, so it looks like it broke inside of calc. So demo.exe was the malware I run, ran, but it broke inside of calc. So clearly the malware is doing something like launching the calculator. We've got to figure out what that is. So we do our couple steps to get back to the code. But if we take a look at our call stack, it doesn't really get us back anywhere. It's still inside of WinINet. What happened here is, uh, you know, since calc is up, we could probably guess that some type of process injection is happening. Maybe the malware started calc and injected into it with shell code. When that happens and eventually a call to connect happened, it's possible that the call stack reassembly inside our debugger got screwed up. It's possible that a thread was created and therefore the call stack couldn't be traced back because it's, you know, waiting for that thread to, to end. Uh, there's a variety of reasons that, you know, this call, uh, the call stack tracing uh, might not work like it did in the case of web server. So we need another, another way of doing this. What we could do is say, well, if there's show code injected, there's going to be a read-write ex uh, execute section inside of memory. We pull up the memory map inside of Ollie debug, and we see one of those right here. Of course, uh, that means that this section is likely to be our show code. Which means if our shell code is doing the connect, which it is, right, it's through some API call, uh, it's when the code is done connecting, it's going to come back to this code. So one thing we could do is we could set a break on access, which will break next time the uh, instruction pointer is running inside this memory section. So we set a break on access there. And we can hit play. Maybe I have to play again. Play again. It keeps breaking on the debug break. Oh, there we go. So sometimes it, it breaks a few times, but eventually the break on, or finally our break on access broke, and now we're sitting inside our shell code. And you can scroll up and realize that, you know, hey, this call, well, right now it just shows it as e, EBP minus 74, you know, some location on the stack, but uh, that call was responsible for uh, the network connectivity that occurred. Also, let me just fix the window here inside of, since I changed the display settings. Also, when we look at the stack right where the show code is, there's a bunch of ASCII on the stack. We could take a view of, of that ASCII dump and say, oh, well, looks like it goes to aapracticalmalwareanalysis.com. We see that and test.jpg. If we go to FakeNet, that makes sense because we see uh, we received a DNS query for aapracticalmalwareanalysis.com, and also it did a GET request for test.jpg. So it makes sense that we'd, we would see those strings right here in memory. Also, in this example, I put a, a contrived hidden key, and you can see that that's, you know, just a, that's the hidden key that you would look up. It's just a, a simple example, but it, it gives you a sense for, for what might actually be occurring. So it's a couple different options for how we can get back to our code once that breakpoint is hit, right? We could set a break on access in the shell code. We could do a stack trace depending on how the code is working. So another feature that was added, uh, stop DNS service. Uh, this stops the DNS cache service in Windows, um, also known as DNS client. Uh, what happens in, in Windows is, you know, we're logging processes, right? Uh, we're, we're logging which process is doing the connection. Uh, the issue with that is, is on Windows, your browser doesn't actually do the DNS request. Your browser, like Internet Explorer or Mozilla, they do not go over port 53 to do the connection. Not a lot of people know that. 
what actually happens is it talks to a service in Windows, and that service is what does the connection on port 53 on your behalf. So therefore, for FakeNet, if you want you know, to be logging the proper process name for who, who's actually responsible for the DNS request, you're going to have to turn off the service. Okay, so example of that, um, yeah, so example of that is, you know, you turn on this, ser uh, this feature, stop DNS client service, and, and we'll see the difference. So let me go back and just demo that real quick. So let's go inside of FakeNet. Let's close down FakeNet first. FakeNet 2, configuration file. Let's turn off the connection break. So we stop breaking on the connection. And then let's turn on the stop DNS uh, client service to yes. I don't recommend stopping critical Windows services on all occasions, but sometimes it's useful if it gets you the information you want to get. But that's why it's an option in the configuration. <laughs> So run FakeNet, and if I uh, just open up our, our, uh, our web browser here, we'll see that now, this time, uh, it, we actually see Internet Explorer connecting out over port 53 to do the request. I should probably, um, I'd have to reboot the machine to get that service back up to show you the opposite. But the opposite is, <laughs> uh, which I should have showed you first, was that your browser doesn't connect on port 53. So that doesn't get logged, right? So this is a good way to, if you want to figure out which process is actually responsible for the DNS request, you're going to have to turn on this feature. Make sense? Uh, post response, uh, I got this feature request by, from a lot of people, uh, is that malware uh, often will do a post, but actually think that uh, data is going to come back from that post. Almost basically, almost like a find and replace for instead of doing get request, they're just doing taking get out and putting a post in. And their server on the other end is custom. So it doesn't, you know, a normal web server will react a certain way to a post request, but a malware, you know, operated uh, you know, server might you know, just act like it's a get instead of a post. And that's actually very common in malware. And so common that I got a lot of requests for it and I added it in as a feature. And so this option is you know, post response, you turn to yes or no, and that'll basically just say, okay, if they do a post to an HTML file, we'll, we'll give them an HTML file back. If they do a post to a JPEG, that's possible, um, then we give them a JPEG back. Uh, and it's the same sort of concept to how we work with guest requests, just with posts. Um, but you, know, you have the option to turn that on. So if you realize you run FakeNet and you see the malware does it, first thing it does is a post request. What, what I do then is go back in, turn this feature on, and say, okay, let's try and serve it something back. Maybe we can get the malware to do more stuff. Uh, depending on how the malware operates, that might actually work. Also, this is the most common uh, user error is that you don't have uh, an IP address or a proper network interface set up on your system. For example, if in VMware you don't have the connected box checked, uh, and so if you don't have that connected box checked, uh, you're going to you're going to run run into a problem because there's going to be no uh, network interface. Um, so therefore, we detect if you have an IP address or not. Uh, also. I just recommend having an IP address, period, because not, not just does FakeNet need a network connectivity, but malware needs it as well. So your malware analysis might not go as well anyway, regardless if you're using FakeNet or not. So always make sure that that checked uh, connected box uh, is on whatever or virtualization software you use. Uh, nice thing about VMware is it you know, automatically has DHCP and can just serve you up an IP address, so you don't really have to worry about it. You just check the box, and you're good to go. Uh, our uh, additional non-useful changes uh, is we have a sexy new icon. And uh, you know, Tank's not too happy about it, I guess. 
We debated about the logo. Um, but anyway, uh, there's also a lot of bug fixes. Uh, we had a lot of you know, issues over, over time, finally, finally putting out a new version. Uh, about two, has it been two years? I think it's been about two years the tool's been out. Um, and we, we added additional default files just because, you know, what, what are the most common files that are getting solved, uh, served up? So we started serving up like bitmap and icons and a few others um, that I didn't list here. Um, so not super useful changes, but, you know, if, the way you know your tool is, a tool is good is if it has an icon or not, right? If it doesn't have an icon, it's, it's like a worthless tool, right? So we need that. Um, what's, what's next for, our, for the tool development? Um, you know, next we're, we're going to start focusing on uh, Windows uh, uh, WFP support. So, you know, LSPs were deprecated. Uh, like Andy said earlier, the tool still runs on Windows 7, uh, Windows 8. It's just limited in, on all of these different features. For example, the debug breakpoint uh, won't hit. Uh, and so we're, we're going to focus our attention to next is getting this working in Windows 8 with all of the features. Um, but we have to move from LSP to the Windows filtering platform. Uh, uh, Windows decided to change the way they, they do these things. And so we have to write a completely new, um, you know, we have to completely change the way we do our hooking, essentially, right, to be able to gather all this information. And so... Uh, that's uh, what we're focused on next. I would also like to thank uh, a variety of people. Uh, this guy, Sebastian, he, he wrote like a little wiki page on how to use FakeNet uh, that a lot of people have accessed. And I, I ripped some stuff out for this presentation from his wiki because it was so, his documentation on our tool is so much better than our documentation that, I, that I'm going to copy and paste from it a lot. Uh, so thank him for that, uh, and William Richard helped out writing some of the uh, demos and, and the lab for the workshop as well. Uh, you could download the code, Bleeding Edge version of FakeNet 2. We have not done an official public release of it. That's going to happen in the next couple weeks here. Just fixing a couple more bugs um, that we have teased out via testing. Uh, and so, uh, but you can download that code uh, from that link there. It's just, I just posted it in Dropbox, so you could just pull it down real quick. So, hands-on section. Uh, I know you guys are all hungry for lunch because they're doing a very late lunch. Uh, so, we basically got a really bad slot. We get before and after lunch. So, everybody's hungry before lunch and everybody's falling asleep after lunch. Uh, but anyway, uh, the goal here is, like I said, the, f the first hour here we did a bunch of demos. We explained to you how FakeNet worked. But after lunch, uh, we're going to come back and actually get hands-on with FakeNet. Those of you that got the USB stick copied, um, you know, come back after lunch, we'll get, we'll get on the VM, we'll follow the lab steps to be able to do a challenge. And uh, the, winner, the winner of the challenge, which means the per person who first completes it, will get, a, get some beer. La Trappe is the only, I think it's the only Trappist brewery in the in, uh, Netherlands. Um, but very, very good beer. So I, I set the bar very high, or hopefully encourages you a lot. So... Does anybody have any questions? Anybody who's not rushing to get lunch? Yeah, and uh, if I could get the USB sticks back and keep those passed out, we'll be sticking around a little bit if you have any questions for us. And then uh, after lunch, which I think is like 2.15, I think it is, 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock we'll get started on the labs. So, thanks. <laughs>